Hey, what's up with you, Ron here? Today I'm gonna share with you one of my approaches for uh, painting details. Uh, this I feel like is a very dumb kind of approach because it's to me it's the ultimate approach. I don't actually have that much of a plan, but I'm focusing on whatever it is I'm painting at the moment. Uh, so we're gonna dive a bit into that uh, once we get to the painting stage. For now, let's talk briefly about the drawing stage. Uh, I didn't cut out too much of it here. Feel free to use the timestamps, just to skip to the painting section if you'd like that. My approach here is because I have this egg carton, um, I'm, I'm dividing it to a grid that shows where every egg is. This is a process I'll often do, starting from the large details to the small details, because I find it's very hard to orient if I just start from one singular detail. It actually can work. Most of the time you won't calculate the space on your paper correctly, but you know, maybe that's not that as important to you and that is perfectly fine. Uh, and I enjoy the challenge once in a while of just sketching directly. But for the most part, this kind of a grid really helps because it shows me exactly where I'm going to put each egg and each divider between the eggs. As you can see here, I'm starting uh, to put that first divider. So I'm visualizing where its base is um, and where the top part is. And then I'm kind of putting in the eggs. Uh, it's so funny because I really like the way I approach the sketching stage here. Uh, the one thing I could have done a little better is to um, just sketch the eggs a little rounder. And that, that translates later on to the painting. It's funny how sometimes the thing you do in the, in the sketching stage can really dictate later on uh, your your results in drawing because it really is all influenced by one another. Uh, but in case I'm setting these up, you see they're kind of changing their angle. I'm not going as extreme as I see it in the reference photo where it really all of these dividers change their angle. I'm kind of keeping it um, very sketchy. Uh, and I am drawing mostly where I see a separation of light and shadow too. Uh, so that's something else you'll see in there, uh, especially for the eggs. You see, I'm using a full line for sharp shadows and then a, uh, almost like a jagged or dotted line for the uh, smooth transitions. That's a good way for me to hint. That's kind of the legend I built for myself on how to do this. Uh, you know, everyone's going to have d different ways. You can actually use a dotted line to do this. Uh, you can you, you don't even have to do this. You can just draw the details and wing the shadows, you know, whatever works for you. Uh, that's one way I like to do that. Just like I like to sometimes scratch, uh, do some cr some hatching where the shadow is. Here I didn't, though. Uh, because the pattern is relatively simple. Light comes from the right, hits the eggs, the card and everything, and casts shadows to the left. Now, while we're drawing this, I do want to direct your attention to one more thing there, the temperatures. So what I love about these kinds of um, subjects, it's all pretty much gray, which first makes it easier because you don't have to match very hard colors. Second, it allows us to play in the temperatures. So if we use gray as our baseline, which everyone, you know, always bugs me on why I don't never clean my palette, because that creates a nice basis gray. And then we add to it a bit yellow, a bit red, a bit blue, we can every time push it in a different direction. And that's kind of what I'm after here. So let me show you the approach for me for this one is I'm painting the thing I'm painting at the moment. And the point I found to start a good point for me was kind of top right corner. So I'm painting the light value around that egg, which is going to bring out the lightness of the egg itself. And as I said, I'm working on whatever I'm working at the moment. So I'll probably from, from there make a transition and just start painting the eggs while really disregarding, you know, the idea of how long has it been? Can I, will I get perfect flow? I don't really care about that. I'm using very wet pale paint anyway, so I have a lot of time. I pre-wet and then I put in the paint. This is one way I like to achieve smooth edges. It sometimes works much better for me than to put the paint and then smoothen the edge. I'll just pre-wet the area and then wherever I put the water is where I'll get a clean edge. Um, now, I'm well aware that this isn't going to be my final values. I'm going to push things to be darker later on. But I want to establish something for myself to be able to orient in the next wash. Um, and you will just see me all throughout this process, you know, bouncing from one detail to another. But pretty much like a wave, I'm working from one side to the other. Uh, and while I'm working on an area, I'm in it. I'm working on the area. I'm focusing on the area. 
um, that allows me to bring the most out of it, uh, to bring enough value, enough color, enough whatever, everything. And even though these aren't the final values, it allows me to, it, it sets me off the right way. Um, it allows me to, the ne for the next stage, know where I'm at and know what I'm doing. So you see, while this area is still wet, I'm going to put the shadow in there. This is, this is, by the way, this shadow is almost a final value. It's really close. And I'm filling in the gaps uh, between the white areas and the mid values for the shadows. And, you know, if you're at a point where you're able to just do that without a big plan in advance, um, you'll do really well. It's very similar to how I painted the um, basket of apples uh, not too long ago. <coughs> um, the idea of just looking at the thing and painting it as I see it Whenever I'm doing these kinds of processes, I am so fully invested. I'm so in the moment. Um, I'm so deeply focused, and it's never by effort. I'm just I get, just get sucked into the process that way, um, which is why I, I'm I'm a sucker for these kinds of processes. And and quite frankly, I would love to use these almost as a default always. Uh, sometimes the subject matter and the arrangement dictate a bit of a different process. Usually it will happen with larger scenes, but with these kind of scenes where there's a lot of shadows and little highlights, uh, to me that's the perfect process. And it's the process of no process. It's the process of absent-mindedness. It's the process of just painting it as I see it. Uh, to me that's the perfect idea. And already you're seeing a bit of a warmer feel on that egg below, a bit of a cooler feel on the egg above. It's not even cool, actually. It's neutral tint, but the gray in this context looks a little cool. I'm going to further exaggerate this effect in a few moments. Um, I had a point and I forgot it with something interesting. We'll get back to that later on. Uh, but, but, you know, these processes, again, are the thing I probably enjoy the most in watercolor. Oh, yeah, I wanted to... What was it? I, I keep, it keeps escaping me. I'm sorry about that. But I will take this um, opportunity of a, a little bit of a brain fart uh, to suggest if you aren't subscribed, definitely make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you can leave a like uh, and hopefully a comment too, let me know how you find this process so far. I'll be super duper grateful for that. Um, but yeah, uh, so in a moment, you'll see me starting to push more of the colors um, to stretch out that middle gray, okay? So the way I like to think about it, and this turns out this is revolutionary to, to many people, so, because um, I don't always describe it that way. I look at it as, this is my base color, it's a gray, and every time I stretch it in a different direction, I'll stretch it towards the red, as you see there, towards the blue, towards different directions. Now. What this does is because I keep using the same gray and in fact the red I'm using here slowly becomes a part of my gray because it's mixed into the gray when I add more blue, right? It's still, some of the red is still there. Some of the blue I used is still there. What it leads to is a very harmonious result. Um, everything has to work together because everything has everything in it. Uh, so my gray, right now, what, what do you see me mix? Uh, was there a bit of warmth there earlier, if I'm not mistaken? See, it all works. Uh, but now it's starting to stretch a bit the temperature. So you see me pushing it more towards the uh, blue-gray, just a bit more blue. Now, people always like to ask about the colors I'm using. So I'm using a bit of a different combination. Um, I thought Ruth, Ruth made a noise there. She's just sleeping. Um, so this time I'm using a bit of a different one. So I'm using mostly French ultramarine. That's pretty much the usual one. Quinacridone rose, that's also the usual one. But I'm also using neutral tint, and I'm also using Turner's yellow. Once in a while, I'll let the Hansa yellow medium or the New Gamboge or the lemon yellow uh, take a back seat, and I'll use something more like that. <coughs> Turner's yellow is a very gentle yellow. It is very easily dominated by the reds, so that's something you may want to be aware of. Um, especially here, like... To make it look yellow, I really need to bring a lot of yellow in there, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, now, there's actually a lot going on here in the realm of edges. 
the edges are very interesting, right? You see this hard edge next to a soft edge. Um, and I'm not too worried. You see these two washes are touching the egg at the top, egg at the bottom. I'm not worried it's going to reawaken the egg at the bottom. It's not really a concern at this stage. Um, you can worry about it. You can be more meticulous about the areas you cover. You can be a little more pre-planned. Uh, work lighter layers and just know from like in advance exactly what you're gonna paint. Uh, I find sometimes I'll naturally go there, but very often I won't. Um, and it's it, and I find it to be very limiting, right? And if there's one thing I'm I'm trying to remove um, from my processes is limitations. Uh, the more limitations you can remove, the better you'll do. That is just the truth. That's just how it works. Um, doesn't mean it's wrong to have limitations, you know, and, and I sometimes talk about self-imposed limitations just for fun and experimentation, but the less limitations you have that you feel forced to do, the better, uh, and that's one of them. Uh, so you see a lot of beauty and grace is created in these um, contrast of edges, right? So we have hard edge, soft edge, hard edge, soft edge. Um, and that is something I personally really enjoy showing uh, it's not always easy. I do have quite a lot of videos on the topic of edges, so you can go to the channel, just search for them. Um, you'll find plenty. Uh, because the thing is, uh, once you see it, you will just naturally start using it. It's so much fun to always have in mind, oh, what does this edge look like? How should I do this one? Like even now when I'm looking at the right blue side of that divider, I'm thinking, oh, can I blend that blue edge? I didn't do it, but would I? And would it benefit from it? Even though the reference photo, in the photo, it's not, right? Um, uh, so that's something that's on my mind. One more thing I wanna talk about is, um, sometimes people uh, send me questions like, or paintings where it feels really amateurish in the colors. Um, and a lot of it is subjective, by the way, but I just want to say sometimes, um, especially for those who tend to use the colors just the way they are out of the box, just clean French ultramarine, especially all of these colors clean, there's a way to use them so that they look good. There are a few ways. There are many ways, but there are also some ways that tend to look more amateurish. Again, nothing wrong with that, but some ways just don't lend themselves to a sophisticated look, if you will. But the way to find that sophisticated look, to me, is to always mix, uh, is to always have my colors be broken. Almost like when you get started playing the guitar, maybe this analogy will hit for some, or any musical instrument, let's say uh, any chord bass, like a piano, guitar, stuff like that. Um, and you get started with very basic chords, you know, major and minor, but then the more you you do that, the more you find the broken chords and the more you love them, the sus chords, the diminished chords, all of those good stuff that I absolutely love. Um, and you'll start making use of them very naturally. It's the same for, for this kind of a thing. Uh, you start with very clean colors in a very naive way, which is great, nothing wrong with that. Uh, and then you'll slowly find your own sophistication, if you will. Um, sometimes I'll just use strong paint for the heck of it. No real purpose, it will just feel right. Which is why that instinct honestly takes precedence over everything for me. You know, it's just the thing that enables you to do that. Um, looking back, this is very similar to what a lot of people, myself included, tend to call a la prima painting. Um, where you just paint directly, you let the washes touch, you let the areas touch, and that is perfectly okay. Uh, it doesn't mean you finish it necessarily in one wash, but, it, but that first wash is doing a lot of the work. Um, and I actually covered that in the Frustration Free Watercolor course. I have a few Walla Prima processes. Uh, so if that's something you're interested in, that's a great place to check them out. It's almost like a complementary to the Watercolor Realism course in that the Watercolor Realism is that more calculated, is that more, sometimes it's multiple glazes, it's a bit more planned. And nothing is wrong in these approaches. You know, there is no right or wrong here. It's very much what captures you in a specific painting. And sometimes I find that I really don't enjoy a painting process, not because of the subject matter even, but because my approach 
wasn't in line with what I felt I wanted at the moment. It's almost like I knew what the right thing to do for me was at the moment, meaning the thing that will make me feel good about the process and enjoy it. And I just didn't listen to myself. Um, and and then I may redo the painting a different route and I will get a result I love and I would greatly enjoy the process and all of that. Um, so it really is sometimes to... And I talked a bit about it in the sensitivity about the subject matter. It's that, okay, what does the subject matter almost ask me to, to paint it like? Um, so yeah. Now already... Uh, you can start seeing how the light and shadow, it starts to come together very nicely, I think. Um, the eggs start to have volume. Um, this is already beyond what I see a lot of people utilize when it comes to values. Um, most people where their paintings are flat and they, they really yearn for more depth and a sense of three-dimensionality, usually they don't push it to be this dark. But I'm going to push it to be darker in a few seconds. Okay, so that's Another thing to, to throw in there, uh, because this isn't enough for me. Uh, so, you know, if you're painting much flatter, meaning your um, lights are lighter, your darks are lighter, and everything is kind of the same lit value, this could very well be the reason why the result ends up looking a little flat. Um, now here to the left, I'm taking a bit more of a loose approach because there are no eggs. It's just the highlights that are left behind and the nuances in the shadows, which hopefully will read well. Um, a lot of it is just trusting myself that things will work out. And I just remembered my point from earlier. So talking about, you know, how this process is very much intuition, very much what I feel like in the moment, very much the vision takes precedence over everything you do need some basic understanding of the medium to do that. So if you're looking at this and you're you're telling yourself, well, I have no idea what I'm doing. It could be the vision. It could be like you still don't know what you like. You still haven't acquired the taste for it. And that's just another step in the way. Or it could be that on a very basic level, you haven't yet acquired the, the technical understanding of paint, which it makes fully sense you know I would say um, if you have been experimenting with uh, watercolor for over I don't know a few months you should get an understanding of the basics of how they handle assuming you actually experimented with them and not just followed a predetermined process that someone told you what to do at every point along the way if you have done that you should already have an understanding. I'm not talking about being super proficient because I'm not that too. My technique isn't, isn't as good as some of these, especially Korean artists you see out there that they know exactly how much paint to have on the brush, on the paper, on the palette at every single moment in time. Uh, I'm not there, but I feel like I'm still able to execute on my vision very well. Um, and that to me is a kind of knowledge you acquire very fast. Um, it doesn't take years, maybe months, could be in weeks too if you're really determined. Uh, but I would say to me it was a couple of months to start feeling that way. Of course, a year later I felt like a year ago I didn't know anything, right? You always grow and learn, but but it shouldn't take long, just for the sake of it taking long. It should take as long as it should take. That's the thing, right? For some it'll take a little longer, maybe you want to really understand the technique, uh, in a very deep way. So, you know, nature <laughs> dictates that, by the way, this is a very important shadow. Uh, nature almost dictates that it will take you longer, but for the most part, the basic understanding I'm, re I'm referring to is something very quick. Now, as soon as you acquire that, or once you have that, this is the kind of process you're probably able to follow. Doesn't mean you'll get the same result as me, you'll never see watercolor. Doesn't mean you'll get a better or worse result than me. But you should be able to do that, you know, um, from what I've seen and from my personal experience. Now, one thing that is shouting to me right now and I will fix later on is to make the highlights on the eggs mean more, I will probably need to paint the desk itself or the table or the surface. So you'll see me later on darkening it ever so slightly just to give more meaning to the highlights. That's something very common. Now... It is time to push this more towards the final values. 
Now, the way I've been doing this lately, we're halfway through, you know, buckle up. There's a bit more to go. Hopefully you're enjoying this one still. <coughs> the way I've been doing this lately, and I forgot to cut out this part where I'm doing nothing, sorry, um, is I'm almost repeating the colors I used the first time because I found that that enhances them. So if you put a thin glaze of brown and a thin glaze of more brown above it, it will make it look more brown, more saturated, more fun. Um, you could glaze a warm on cool, a blue on red, a red on yellow, whatever you want. If you're, if you got the colors pretty much right the first time and you only want to amplify it, um, I find that the same version of the color works really well or close one. So if you have a brownish red and you glaze a clean red over it, that will still amplify it. Okay. I'm talking just science here. What happens when you glaze two transparent layers, one over the other. So if you like the colors you have and you just want to amplify them, make them stronger, make them feel more bright, more saturated, I'll be using the same colors to do that. Okay. Uh, now my mid values are pretty much good. The, the thing that's missing is the deeper shadows. Uh, and you see me starting to uh, indicate them here from that egg. Now we have the, there are a few interesting things going on here in terms of the science of light and shadow too, by the way. So you'll notice the top of the egg. I'm trying to, how, to think how I can demonstrate this. So let's say this is an egg, right? You'll notice that the top of the egg, or it's not even the top. That's a, that's a wrong way to explain it actually. Um, I need an oval like object, but whatever. Let's say this is an egg, right? And you have the line where it crosses from light to shadow. You'll notice the line where it crosses from light to shadow, there's, it's actually darker than the shadow. So the, the reason this happens is because you have reflected light inside the shadow part. So what actually happens is this is the egg. This entire side is in the shadow, right? But there's a bit of reflected light on the bottom of that shadow, making it lighter. That reflected light is reflected. Here I am, by the way, glazing blue over blue. That reflected light comes off of these dividers that are light. So they reflect back light on the eggs. It comes from other eggs. It comes from the environment. This is a very common pattern you'll see where the transition from light to shadow actually has the darkest value. And if you're able to catch this nuance, um, the result is going to be more believable. It will look more realistic, plainly speaking, in simple terms. Uh, and I think I managed to do that quite well with the egg on the top right there. I didn't try to do that with every egg. I didn't succeed in doing it with every egg. Um, but the effect is there. Here's where some people... Um, make a mistake. Now, the reason it's actually a mistake is they don't see things accurately. Um, and there, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're actually trying to paint it as you see it, you need to see it accurately. So where, where some people go astray is they think the highlight on the egg is actually as light as the right side. That is not true. I can prove it to you. And I, I think I've shown it in multiple videos, actually. And if I remember where at the 2311, I'm going to write it down for myself. I'll forget. 2311 mark light shadow. Because I want to show you this. Uh, so hopefully I remember. Um, I'll show you. The darkest, the lightest point on the darkest side is, side is still darker than the highlight, than the light side. So when you look at the egg, right side is expo exposed to the light. Left side has a highlight in it for reflected light. The highlight in it is still much darker than the lightest side. And that's the importance of core shadows. Actually showing the division between light and shadow will lead to a more realistic view. That's just the way it works. Um, and it's okay if you're not into getting a realistic result, if you're into being a little more expressive of whatever you have there, whether it is congruent with reality or not, but just have that in mind. Um, and I will, uh, and I have demonstrated this hopefully on the screen for you. Um, so I'm in the process of making these shadows darker so that there's a clean separation between the light and the shadow. And then the little highlight, quote unquote, within the shadow that's actually reflected light can shine. And the part that is exposed to light can also shine very well. Gonna take a sip of water here. But this is a good reminder. Once again, uh, if you haven't checked out my frustration free water color course, I have about two 150, a quarter million subscribers here. And I think a couple of thousands more 
high thousand, no, maybe mid thousands have signed up for the frustration free watercolor course. So if you, so there are a lot of people who haven't, that's the short of it. This is exactly what I show there. So if you like this kind of process, check it out. Now, even worse, <laughs> uh, less than that are in the watercolor realism course. So uh, it's like a zero point something percent of my audience. So if you haven't checked it out and you're into the more realistic, meticulous step-by-step -step values, uh, edges, uh, shapes approach, check out a frustration-free watercolor course. I will put all the links in the description box below. Now we're coming to the left side and this is actually, it was important for me to get the nuances of dark and light, light and dark there uh, as accurately as I could, that entails getting those the depth right where the egg sits is darker, and the more it goes up to that divider, like I'm really looking at these three-dimensional shapes, the more it goes up into the divider, the lighter it gets. So it's almost like a a you have a um, you have dug a hole in the ground, and the deeper you go into the hole, it is darker. It's one of those things that were really important for me to show. Look at how the that shadow on the left, and especially above the divider, will define its edge right here. Look at, look at what I'm going to do. I, I think it happens in a second, or maybe I forgot and I'm not doing it, or maybe I'm doing it later. I'm not sure. But those shadows behind are going to um, really tell us where the dividers are, okay? Um... And this is a whole different kind of um, kind of a mode, if you will, because it's really in the darks. In the uh, let's say you have a scale of one to ten, ten is the darkest. So this is really in the five to ten or six to ten. A bit tough sometimes if you're used to painting a light. Uh, so it may be something will take a bit of repetition, but just a bit, not repetition for repetition's sake. I stopped believing in that a long time ago. They're one of those things like you have to do a skill rep repetitively to uh, develop to develop it. Eh, not really. Not really. It's not the repetition that gets the success. It's the perception of doing the thing from the right place. So if you... Uh, it, it is relevant even to sports. If you know where the action comes from, you'll do really well after few attempts, not years of doing the same technique, because when you think about it, it doesn't make really sense. If you know how to do a, a, a thin wash, <laughs> painting a, a, a thin, even wash should not take years of practice. And if your bar was that it should, maybe raising the bar is something to consider. Uh, it shouldn't take years. It honestly shouldn't. Um, if you've been doing it for a long time and you still can't, not the occasional blooper, because that happens to me all the time, but like if you just don't, get, it's it's a gap in understanding, right? Uh, and I'm curious to hear if you have any questions following this this statement in particular and other things we discussed so far. Um, let me know if you have a question down below. I'm curious to hear them uh, and see if I can address them in the comments. Um, I'm just loosening up that edge just slightly. It's still going to be a relatively hard edge, but just I wanted to add a layer of slight lightness near the edge um, and I don't even remember what happens now I still need to darken some spots I need to paint the background I need to darken the top of the cardboard carton box whatever you want to call it uh, I know it's an egg box in the UK uh, and it's an egg carton I think in the US so hopefully I'm, I'm accurate about that uh, we call it in Hebrew it's just carton carton um, which can explain why if you hear someone who's a native Hebrew speaker saying it in English, they will say uh, egg carton, which is going to sound very awkward. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so for the background, which I'm going to tackle in a moment, I'm just, I just want to make sure I push the, 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 the core shadows on the eggs to actually look like light and shadow clear the vision. Um, for the background, I'm going to use a very light wash that I'm going to start top to bottom, uh, and I'll make it a little darker as I move down. I want to divert your attention to the reference photo. You'll notice that the top of the surface, look at the surface on which the egg carton sits. The top is lighter than the bottom. It's one of those things people keep missing, but it's important. So I'm starting very watery. The, the more I move down, the more paint and value I'm starting to add. 
okay? It's a, it's a very gradual, smooth transition. My shadow that is cast by the Arten is still not fully dry. So look at how I'm approaching it. Once I get there, what I'm gonna do is leave a very small white gap and close it off carefully. Uh, this is something I always do. So if I'm compelled to paint an area, I'm going with my feeling, even if it uh, meets or intersects with a wet shape. Because my instinct usually is correct. So what I'll do is leave this small gap you see here, and then I will carefully close it off very gently. If you do it gently and the paper is decent, you should not probably reawaken anything in, a, in an egregious manner. You should be good. Now I'm adding a bit more red and yellow just to make the bottom a little more colorful. I like to add colors to the thing that is closer to us. The bottom is a little closer to us, so there we go. Just a touch of color. It's barely going to be noticeable, but it will give it this extra bit of interest, punch, whatever. Um, there's a bit of a, a kind of diagonal shadow there, just very gentle, come back with clean water to smoothen out the edge. Uh, and I'm going to pre-wet this part so that I can go back and darken it. I have noticed I went a little too cool there, so the color I'll be using now is mostly a warm gray uh, to cover it up. Um, and I will leave, you see where the carton goes up to, to, to close on the eggs? That's where it goes a little lighter. It's one of those nuances, you know, if you pay attention, you will want to capture it. It's not going to be the end of the world if you miss these small nuances, but I wanted to, to keep it there, uh, if that makes sense. So my temperatures here are all over the place, uh, which I love. That's kind of what I was driven to, to paint this. Um, but I may do another go where I plan them out a bit more. Um, some organization and the colors can also have an impact on the, obviously, on the and the look of the painting. Uh, usually when it comes to realism, it's all about these values and getting the values somewhat in the ballpark. Uh, but when it comes to the feel of it, the harmony, the organization, the composition, paint does play a role. Um, so it's another thing to think about. Uh, and yeah, now you'll notice again, some areas just need to be a little darker. Look at, look at the photo where I'm just now placing this paint. It contrasts much stronger with that divider. Um, and, and those are really important things for me to show. Um, now, where we talk about compos there is the, the basic level of showing something, showing contrast, showing value, showing whatever. Then there's the more advanced element of where am I showing it and where am I not showing it. So what I usually do uh, is show more contrasts near the focal point. My focal point is the eggs on the right side. So that's where I'm pushing the values to be a little darker. Whereas on the left, they are darker because there are no eggs there, but it's almost vague. And you'll notice I don't go as dark as some spots in the reference photo. And I did a lot of it wet and wet, so everything is blended a bit. Uh, and that kind of moves it away to the left. So it's, it doesn't steal too much of the attention, if that makes sense. Uh, but for example, the bottom of this thing needed to be darker. All of these little points needed to be darker. On the right, the divider to the right there with the four eggs on the right, that needs to be darker. That gap between the egg and the divider need to be darker. Um, and again, when I say need, you know, the only real um, definition of it is needed for the purpose I have, right? It's not like there's one way to finalize this painting. Um, now you see why... I usually don't struggle with, you know, adding too many details or adding too much, you know, or overworking because all I'm looking for is if I take, a, in this particular one, it's not always the goal, but usually if I take a few steps back and it looks right, that's good for me. Sometimes it's hard to see it cleanly, so I just uh, take a break, put the painting somewhere and revisit it a few hours a day later. I know immediately. Sometimes flipping it upside down can do that for you. Sometimes just looking at it from a distance can do that for you. Uh, but once it, I see the finished product, I see it, I know it's done, it's done. No, this actually is not done yet. Uh, this one egg in particular lacked the clear uh, division between light and shadow that I completely forgot about in the previous step. Uh, so I'm going to enhance that now. And if I'm not mistaken, that is the last thing I do. Maybe I add a few more small touches, but uh, yeah, to that egg below probably didn't feel strong enough as well. 
though again it's not a must to take a few steps away from the screen you will get the impression immediately you'll know what you're looking for uh the eye and the brain are very clever they know exactly what they're looking for usually it's not a problem um but yeah they're gonna get that um um what do you call it? That darker, I guess, area and the transition from light to dark. And I'm using a damp brush sometimes to move that around and control it a bit. That's something I'll do as well. Uh, just to help it blend if necessary. Um, and with, a, again, a moist but almost dry brush just to blend that edge. Uh, and we are pretty much done. Um, that's how I love to paint very often. It's a clean, just experience of painting the section I'm working on. And I cannot describe to you how fun and exhilarating it is. Um, and I think everyone has their own kind of sweet spot of how they like to create. And to me, that usually puts me straight in the zone. I stared at the paper and the brush. The whole painting process was so much fun. There was never really a doubt. Um, now I can look at things and say, oh, I could have done this better or that better. While doing it, there was never doubt. I was so in it, so invested. Uh, here it is, a uh, zoomed in uh, result. You can see all the details in the scan. Here's another view of it. I want to thank you so, so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I will take this opportunity to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon. If you want to get credits at the end of my videos, see your name up there. Uh, be sure to check it out. Uh, Frustration-free watercolor course, as I mentioned. Watercolor Realism course, link in the description box for everything. I will see you in the next video. Until then, take care.